Hey, what's up garden friends? How's everybody doing? I hope you're good. I am great. Out here having fun with my plants, giving the fish a nice feeding and they, come on guys, come on, eat your food. What are you doing? They're so hooked on the sturgeon food that sinks. I throw some koi food to the top and they're like, that was good. Now let me go down to the bottom because I've been tricking them. I put the floating food in, then I put the sinking. It's a whole thing. It's neither here nor there. Look who's in bloom. Would you please? No, you don't want to. This is my Athalandra Sinclariana, also known as the Panama Queen, the Coral Athalandra, the orange shrimp plant, which is, I don't know, it's not a Justicia, but I can see the resemblance, I suppose. Seeing as how the flowers come and rise up out of the bracts, the pink being the flowers, the orange being those bracts. So I guess it's similar to a Justicia in that regard. This is an awesome winter bloomer, really like late winter into spring. This Athalandra is actually one of my favorite tropical plants. And you can probably see why. To me, the flowers on these guys really just sort of epitomize what is a tropical plant. They're bright and vibrant. They have a lot of contrast. The flowers have that fun tubular mechanism to them that's really appealing to hummingbirds and pollinators. It's beautiful the way the flowers shoot right out of these guys. And I love orange and pink, so that helps a lot too. Let's do a spotlight on this. You can see what it looks like. I don't need to keep rambling saying, hey, look how pretty it is. You can see it. You be the judge. It's beautiful. Ethelandra Sinclariana. This is a true, true tropical. These are hardy only to the warmest parts of zone 10, zone 11. They do not like cool temperatures. This is a plant that I treat fairly similar to a heliconia in the regard that I want to make sure that I take my plants outside during the summertime, that when fall comes around, it comes back in when the nighttime temperatures are dipping below 50. They really don't like it. Though they do have some frost tolerance. They're not really a plant that would be frost resistant. So, I mean, a frost... A brief frost, I should say, isn't going to kill them, but you're gonna lose some foliage. The plant's just not gonna look good. And they need the warmer temperatures to thrive. There are a fair amount of plants like the croton where they can take a little bit of frost. It's gonna damage the foliage. They may defoliate but that will come back. But the thing that really makes the difference is what are the returning daytime temperatures if you have a really cold night? Is it gonna get nice and toasty again the next day? If not, and by toasty, I mean over like 75. That's where you would need to be to really compensate for that damage. If not, then that's when I move them in. I see these listed as being a full sun plant fairly often. In my experience, when I've put them in full sun, the foliage is scorched very, very, very easily. Outdoors, I wouldn't put them in full sun. Maybe part sun and making sure that that's filtered in the afternoon. So basically some morning sun and filtered afternoon shade. In the house, really bright, intense light. That'll do the trick for them. Keep them away from cool drafts, from vents, from anything that's gonna be blowing the air around them, drying the foliage out. And that's because these guys are very thirsty. Today alone, this isn't normal. It got really, really toasty in here today. But today alone, I've watered this Athalandra four times, which I know is crazy, but that's also the potting mediums and draining and drying a little bit too fast. I do think in the summertime, I'll be repotting this into something that's a little bit more moisture retentive. Probably not too much though. They do not like wet feet, but kind of like a lot of other house plants, like a pothos, when they're dehydrated, you know immediately. These leaves, they droop, they hang down, and then you water it, they perk back up. It's always ideal to water before leaves start to droop down, but at least it lets you know, but you don't have a lot of time with this plant to go ahead and get in and give it some more water. A very, very, very thirsty plant. The higher the humidity, the less often these would need to be watered. In a dryer home with tons and tons of light and uh, you know circulating air, they're gonna dry out more quickly. So you have to water more frequently. And the humidity out here has been a little bit low, but it's starting to pop back up because I just did a watering. Humidity, I think around 50% and up will keep you from having to water them very often. They had dropped to 37 and that's my fault. It got so hot in here that I actually opened the doors. If you don't know, if you're new here, hi, hope you're well. I'm in my garage that I wrap an area in plastic. That way I don't have to heat as large of an area, but it's like 20 degrees outside. And when it started getting towards 90 in here, I was like, okay, that's not gonna work. I popped the garage doors open for a few minutes to help cool things off, but that dry winter air drew. It doesn't matter. That's why I had to water it so much today. Typically with the temperatures in the mid to upper 70s and low 80s, I probably water this guy, I would say every other day to every two days. And in a more moisture retentive potting mix, I would probably only have to water it, I would say, well, probably still like twice a week. These guys get about 10 feet tall, five to 10 feet wide. Best time to prune them is right after they're done blooming. I usually like to let my plants rest a little bit after a bloom. 
and you just cut them right underneath the oh no losing a flower there right around there that's going to encourage some more bushy full growth i like to make my pruning my cut right below the flower bud maybe even another section below so somewhere probably i'd say three to four inches down from the flower at times just like with a justicia if it starts to get really really leggy you can cut a third to even half the plant back and that will also encourage lots of new growth to come out from the sides of the stems down in there unlike the aphylandra squarosa the zebra plant that's this one right here aphylandra squarosa zebra plant unlike this guy syncloriana is considered to be toxic i've heard both with the squarosa but more often than that uh, people say it's non-toxic but with something like this i'm still cautious because they drop leaves fairly easily and it's something I don't want to, I have to make sure it's not like stuck to the bottom of my shoe or something because a cat will run up to it and chew on it. So keep it away from pets and children or anyone that might chew on your plant. The flowers are pretty long lasting on here, which is another great thing. Not only is it fantastic because there aren't a lot of plants that do a lot of flowering during the winter time, but the way they start things out when these buds start to pop up, these beautiful orange cones, it takes a fairly long time. These have been coming up for probably roughly, I'd say about a month. And it wasn't until this week that they actually started to push flowers out from those buds. The flowers will rise up gradually, starting from the bottom all the way to the top, somewhere to like a bromeliad or a justicia. And once they reach the top, that flower is going to die off. These are pretty easy to propagate also. Really, uh, leaf cuttings is fine. You don't even need a very big one, just a few inches of stem. The main thing to remember when you take a cutting is that you go ahead and make sure you have a few inches of stem may have to trim off some of the petiole from where it meets the stem and then once you have that into the if you're going to use like water or a moist soil whatever you're doing that the humidity needs to stay high that's fairly true for rooting pretty much anything moisture loving tropicals i should say there are tropical cactus and succulents and things like that that still are on the more arid side but these guys specifically, it'd be good to go ahead and keep a bag over it, a plastic cup, something, put it in something to keep the humidity up. I will be taking cuttings from this and doing some propagation with it. Once these are done flowering, which I think that this should stay in flower, for probably about I'd say two to three weeks and so when that's done flowering I will be taking clippings off of here and I may as well try and propagate those oh hey hi autofocus what you doing there we go like I mentioned before these are a great plant to have around for pollinators I know I made it sound like this was a fair like kind of a complicated plant it's just thirsty that's really all it is it's a plant that likes water similar to something like a photonia though I don't think as finicky as a photonia I've had mixed experiences with photonia some of them can dry up and they're fine and sometimes they, they don't like it at all typically though it's a plant that likes frequent watering it likes a nice rich organic well draining but somewhat moisture retentive potting mix and frequent fertilizing with a nice rich organic fertilizer something with even micros and macros do you know 20 20 20 14 14 14 something like that that's fine i'm a really big fan of seaweed fertilizer with my tropicals you get a lot of nice lush growth when you use seaweed fertilizers it does good things down in the soil it you get nice green foliage. They seem to respond well to it. Because this is a moisture loving plant, something to watch out for would be stem rot and root rot. Anytime I have a plant that likes frequent watering, it's really important to me to make sure that the soil's never staying wet for a very long time. With this, I mean, the reason it wants to be watered frequently is because it's soil drying out a little bit too fast. So shouldn't be an issue with this guy. But if you have an ephalandra and you're noticing you have to water it and water it and water it, then you start to see some yellowing in the leaves, some spotting, go ahead and cut it back. It would be better to have a dehydrated plant than a plant that has root rot or stem rot. That's just because you can bring them back from dehydration so much more easily than you can some type of rot. They're susceptible to your typical pest, mealybug, scale, white fly aphids really kind of all of the above because they're a fairly vigorous grower though one great thing is they do seem to transport systemics fairly well which is nice systemics can be hit or miss with a lot of plants because there's a lot of variation in how they take it up that's pretty much it i just wanted to spotlight this guy and show it off or girl or them non-binary friends all right you be you it's one of my favorites super tropical lovely no fragrance probably should have mentioned that before i haven't noticed any type of fragrance but that's okay when you're this pretty you ain't gotta smell good as long as you don't smell bad. Have any of you guys grown the Sinclariana? Let me know. Comment down below. Or you can hit me up on Instagram, at Tropical Plant Party. Follow me and I'll follow you back. I really have a fun time connecting with everybody on there and looking at each other's pictures. It's a lot of fun being plant nerds together. And don't forget to leave the video a thumbs up. Let the likes help the channel a lot. Help the videos a lot. I really do appreciate it. And I do notice it, so thank you very much. And subscribe as well. I upload multiple times a week. So don't forget to hit that notification bell. That way you know when new videos come out. If you have anything to add, be sure to put it down in the comments. As always, hope everybody's doing well 
well, I'm gonna go ahead and stop talking now because there's gonna be more to talk about with this plant with repottings and propagation. For now, just kind of want everybody to see it and talk about it a little bit. As always, and most importantly, keep on growing. Bye-bye.